So today what I've come to, um, to talk about is missional planting. I just want to give you a case study of what has happened over the past few years. Let me just open in prayer. Gracious God, I just thank you now that we can talk about all the things that you've done, your mighty power, that sweeping like a spirit, that your spirit is sweeping through Wellington, just empowering people with the love and joy of Jesus Christ, I pray in your name. Amen. Missional planting in Wellington began with a concept of community engagement. Um, I began back with Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. It says, when, then when Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, therefore I ask the Lord of the harvest has sent laborers into the field. Too often in our churches, we get very caught up in the head theology because we are very powerful on bringing theology to people and then churches become stagnant. Wellington, when I took over Wellington, was very atypical of what it was like in the United States. Three generations of, ne uh, of growth that's below the populational growth of a country. So you have three generations of people uh, that instead of growing exponentially with the, with the birth of our children and their families and having large churches, populations, uh, the growth of the churches is below the population of growth. Biological. Biological, that's right. And less than biological, because we have a flight of people in my age group, you know, the 30s through 50 year olds uh, leave the church faster. And then we have this, this great vacuum of leadership between the ages of 18 and 50. Um, and then it leaves, we are perched on the preface of having an imploding of our future generations of our churches unless things change. What was amazing to this was that Jesus, when he went around teaching, it was went hand in hand with curing uh, disease and every disease and sickness. Disease in the Greek um, and sickness in the Greek are different. So a, a sickness could be something like depression or um, problems in the home or relational issues. Disease would be like leprosy. You know, they are completely different. And then when I, this verse became a mantra for me that says if you want to go into the communities like Jesus did and have the impact in community engagement the way Jesus did, it's not just about going only with a theology because Jesus in his own actions expressed that he went and fixed people of the problems of what they had. So in Wellington, what we decided to do was design a backbone program that we call Family Ministry. So it's a family enrichment, parenting, and uh, seminar program that I've engaged the community using a, um, a system called Family Ministry and advertised through familyministry.co.nz. So what I've done is centralized community engagement through different programs and community engagement seminars based through relational ministry. What this looks like is something like this. We would go into the community, following Psalms 147, verse 3, heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. We'll go and teach a marriage course, a marriage enrichment course, and we might run it in seven locations, seven times a year, and they're video-based series, so I will go into cafes, I'll go into schools, we'll go into homes like your small group homes, or we'll run them in the churches but the churches will constantly be running a marriage course in the communities. And they'll go to where we don't have people, where people live, and if you drive in 30 minutes away from work, we'll do it out where you live, and, and in the communities of which your sphere of influence is. And we'll begin running marriage enrichment courses. And it's relational ministry based, where we've been inviting people in, you know, print up 10,000 flyers, full color, and we'll go to people, and they'll go, hey, you're made at work. Hey, you're married? Come to this non-threatening seven week course. So over dinner, it's in a booklet, it's faith-based, and then over seven weeks, we befriend people, we get to know them, and through relational ministry, we, be, we build bridges and friends and relational ministry and networks in the communities. Then through family ministries, we decided we need to do this with the parenting, because we, as parents, the church has taken a back seat, almost, is we're allowing society to drive the growth of our children, and instead of the church saying, we're going to be in the forefront of teaching parents and equipping parents on how to <clears throat> provide uh, religious education, boundaries and loving relationships for children. So we've been running maybe in five to eight locations every year. 
a five-week video-based course on parenting. So people, and so right when the marriage course ends, we'll immediately roll two weeks later, go into a parenting course. And then we'll go into another parenting course. And over one year period, we'll run a parenting for teens, a parenting for children, a marriage enrichment, over and over and over. And we will take core groups of people, um, a room like this, and we'll, we'll have three or four teams in this room, and this team will be fully empowered to go out into the community and engage families and grow a relational network of people and build friendships that are lifelong lasting and doing exactly what Jesus asked us to do. Go out, heal people with diseases and broken hearts and bring them the love of Jesus and their lives. Deuteronomy 6, 9 through uh, 6 through 9 says, keep these words of command you on your hearts, recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away. When you lie down and when you rise up, bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them on your doorpost as an emblem on your, on your forehead and write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates. And in Judaism, this is called the Shema. And in Christianity, we use this as our ideas that we have to be as parents training and teaching and equipping our families and our children at the very core. And then, in relative to the case study, I started and I said, you know what? We need to get in the communities and teach people how to care for their bodies through physical exercise. And I am a firm believer that physical enrichment goes hand in hand with your spiritual enrichment. You know, it's the health message of our church. It's the you know, right hand of our church. And First Timothy, what I loved is, while physical training is of some value, and we always try to, some people try to say, well, we don't want to do physical exercise because it's of some value. But what Timothy, Timothy is giving this great idea is that it's of some value. Godliness is the most important thing, of course, in our lives, holding the promise of both the present life and the life to come. If we're bringing people to the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're bringing them our health missions to the church, what we decided to do was go out into the communities and we've been starting up different classes, faith-based community engagement programs revolving around exercise as well. So in, in Lower Hutt Church, we began as a case study on Pilates class. It's been running for three years now. The church hall provides a free Pilates-based program, and then uh, it, it's at full capacity. We can only fit 15 people in the hall, and it's solid 15 people every week. We went out into the local community called Nai Nai, and then we rented a hall. It was a Koha, um, and it was a, uh, we ran a, um, a knockoff. We first ran Zuma, then we ran a knockoff of it because, uh, dance fitness. And so we ran a faith-based dance fitness class, 45 people every single week. It just, people come. And then the relationship builds. So, yes, sir. Can I ask a question? How do you bring uh, people on board and, uh, you know, invite them to, uh, that's what I'm thinking of, the first step to bringing them yeah. on board? It's, it's hard for people to agree to say they're going to come to church for, let's say, a, a Daniel Revelation seminar. Because they're going to be like, what's that about? It's easy to go and say, hey, I have a marriage course. You want to come? They go, oh, yeah. You know, I, I like to learn how to communicate better with my spouse. You and the, letters, flyers, we, we do. Up? And I got an example. I'll show you in just a second what they look like. So I have a printer, and we print 10,000 flyers for every course every time, and it runs us about $600, full color, front, back. It's, they're just absolutely beautiful. Um, so we'll invite them along. And then at the, at the exercise programs, we, get our, we have mentors. So the idea is a core group of Adventists will always be there meeting people, and there will always be suffering, and there will always be people who are hurting. And you make an intentional effort to go and befriend people. And when you befriend them, then you say, hey, you know, Skye, so now you, you know, Ann, how are you doing? And then after a few weeks of doing exercise together, hey, we're also running a parenting course. And it's down at the cafe over here, so it's a non-confrontational place. You want to come down. It's only $10 a night, and people actually pay to come to these. It's not that the church is footing the bill on all this. This is the beautiful part. Is I charge $10 a night, and the people are willing to pay to consume, and, and consumers the ideas, but in the end, it puts them off, because if, if it's free, then they go, oh, the church is trying to sell me something. But if they're paying for it, then they come voluntarily, and then they're there, and then we, we build that friendship. The result of doing these things, of just inviting your sphere of influence and then letterboxing immediately around people where we live, has been we've had enough growth to plant an entire church in Upper, in upper Hut, and then we've had um, enough to start on a second plant engagement right now in, in, in the Hut region. It, it works when the main focus is relational ministry, saying I'm, gonna, I'm going to invite people I already know. 
I, what I found through my own personal history is that we've probably already exhausted all of our friends by saying, hey, come to church. They're like, yeah, that's all right. But if we are offering something that's of value, that fits in everybody's life through a non-confrontational way, I found that people just buy onto it. And it's something as simple as, as I've put three things down called family ministries, and it's enough that as pulling it for next year, all the Wellington region is signing off, is saying this is going to be a primary form of evangelism and outreach for community engagement, that we're willing to dump as all of our resources to say, if we have 14 churches all working, saying we're going to run 20 different marriage courses at the same time, parenting courses, you know, the connection and the collegiality and the spill-off means that they come to my marriage course in Upper Hut, they might go to church down in Lower Hut, and we're all working together for the common good of the kingdom growth. The last thing, suicide. yes, the last thing is New Zealand is ranking one of the highest on suicide uh, amongst youth. Um, my, my wife and I, we went to the health department and we, we, um, we certified with uh, the Department uh, of Health uh, under a program that we were, we were a member of. It's called Applied Suicide Intervention Training. It's ASSIST. It's actually the world's largest suicide intervention training course that's a worldwide program. Um, and it's not done by anybody. You have to go through a, a certification process. <coughs> and so what I've done is four times a year we run suicide intervention courses for community engagements, businesses, hospitals, schools, police departments, churches, other churches, and it, it builds the relational network of a youth inter mentoring program. Part of this lies on, on a different program that we were doing, it's called Youth Connect. We've created a system of youth mentorship called youthconnect.co.nz where we've gone through all the churches and church members volunteer to be part of this charitable trust under our church and they mentor at-risk youth out of court referrals, out of churches, broken homes, parenting courses, marriage courses, and then I get this web of people from all the churches with different backgrounds. And then when I have a youth that's a court referral that maybe have a drug addiction and you know, you know been to jail for six months and has three kids, I can match them up with this person who has that same life skills in our church. And then I get the next court referral. This person's a, a drug overdose. And I put them with this person who's been through that. Match them with people in our churches, and it may be different churches, who can mentor and relationally build a friendship and over time place them and walk hand by hand with them into our churches through a loving relationship instead of, yes ma'am? Sorry, did I mean to a specific training? Yes, yeah. And we put them through the child safety protection policies of our church. Um, we have a vetting board that you know goes and we, you know questionnaires and stuff like that. And, um, yes, sir. So you prepare your members in church to, for training so that they can uh, become uh, useful in this ministry. Yeah. In particular area. Yeah. And let's say in, in my four churches, I might only have four fifteen churches. members. Four churches. Yeah. So I have i I between my wife and I, um, you know, six with a seventh coming on board group. Mm -hmm. Um, I might have 15 or 20 people who want to be mentors. Not much, because not everybody wants to be a youth mentor. You know, it takes a certain calling. But that means between all the groups, three here, three there, three there, then every time I get a court referral, I have a church that might meet their personality. And my demographics of churches are very wide. I have a very conservative church in Lower Hut. So, you know, very um, European modeled, Anglican liturgy, kind of old school, you know, church in New Zealand. I have Wellington Central, which is a multicultural, very conservative <laughs> church. Uh, we pastor over Powerhouse, which is our contemporary Adventist church down there. We pastor over the Jewish Adventist group, which is a specific model of community engagement I'll talk about later. The, um, the Spanish group, which is a language specific and also still very South American in its mindset for Adventism. And so the skill of the pastor then becomes, it's not about my ministry and the model I want to project upon my churches. It's more of equipping and empowering those people to engage people healthily. And then, man, they'll come on fire. Um, you know, the churches aren't doing what I want them to do. They're doing what they want to do. And if you just equip them and put a light under them, <laughs> they explode. So we did this through family ministry. And um, if any church wants to, you know, join in this backbone, man, we'll just, I'll leave these here, you know, 650 bucks for the two banners, and you could jump on board and start doing it, you know, um, and it's quite easy to do, it's, it's a year-long relational building, community engagement 
cost effective, the books cost $10 a person, the videos cost 180, and that's your, that's your price point. Um, we, you feed people at them usually, so if you go to a cafe, they pay 10, and then you might, the church may have to chip in a little extra for the cost of the bill, or you could do it at the church and everybody pitch in and bring the food, but you figured that, that structure out yourself. And two years, it takes a while to turn the Titanic around, I'll call that the Titanic being our church, from thinking that outreach and community engagement is one form of engagement to it's every day, 24 seven, and as a church we're here to be a use with, for people all the time, not just three hours a day. Roger, just a quick question. Go ahead. Family ministry, is this, um, is this you, or is this some organization that you plug into? It, it's, it's us. Okay. It, it's, it's, we found a need, we stepped out under our church and said we're gonna create this organism and uh, organization, I mean, and as it grows, then it will probably change form, of course. But right now, it's, it's me coordinating the engagement of, amongst these churches as a collective effort um, with the other regional pastors in Wellington, too. So the other pastors say, yes. Uh, so like Pastor Toa and I, we go up to Levin, and we're using this medium to plant in another red zone, we're reaching out to the community to meet new people that we've never met before, and as we get to build a friendship relationship, we'll partner them up with existing church members with the intent in one to three years to say, and a place where we've never had a church, we want to have a church meeting. Fantastic. So all these resources are yours? Like the video yeah. Is that yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, right now we're using third-party vendors, um, and then you know, I would love to grow to where we're, you know, like I could video it myself, and then um, it's just a, a growth. Right now it's a growth, growth curve, you know? Um, might have to come up and tag on with your video equipment and actually do them. These are what the, some of the videos look like. And this is an example of what in the next six weeks, four weeks, what we're, three weeks we're doing. Uh, we're doing, um, and you can see the powerhouse, the family ministry, some money from Adrian there, the Legos are on there. One form is we're doing uh, arts and crafts community engagement programs. Um, so we're getting children from the communities and this church is blessed because we're in a church called Power um, Community House in the dead of the CBD district of Wellington, a church where all the community resources are. So there's YMCA, there's the Rape Advocate Victim Center, there's a place called Dress for Success, there's the Maori Trust and Women's Advocacy Group, and there's just all these places where people come for community aid and resource. We plopped a church in there, converted a 200 square meter space into a sanctuary, and then run community engagement in the in faith-based. So now when people come seeking community engagement, so now we're writing, hey, we're gonna teach your kids faith-based arts programs. So every day there'll be a biblical theme and then creative arts, um, engaging children and building families. So it builds a family worship environment. Uh, in one church we're doing the parenting teens courses. You can see kind of what those graphics look like. And we're doing a marriage revitalization course in another. Uh, they run, this, these run seven weeks. People register through the website on phone, they text. Uh, we have a parenting kids, a, a different marriage course at a different location. All this spring, we rented a strip mall up in Upper Hut in a place that's a red zone. We've never had an Adventist church. We opened just a few months ago a, a church called The Mission. It's kind of hard to read at the, the light, but on the left it says our, our Adventist church local, on the right it says The Mission. What we've done here is on the right side you have a small chapel about the size of this room on the left side it's cafe style and then the full kitchen so one they run chip they run marriage course parenting course parenting teens and then every sabbath afternoon in, instead of doing ay's instead of doing all those kind of things because they're a missional plant they're not sustaining institution right now their intent is to go out to the community to meet new people so every saturday afternoon they're running some form of community engagement project that invites the entire community and we place this with next door to countdown. So we have huge foot traffic. Uh, we open the door, we put out the buffet tables, and I put a sign out on Sabbath afternoon when I'm there that says come in for pastoral uh, talks, and people just walk in and talk Jesus. Uh, and that's exciting, who you meet, because you just never know the conversation you're gonna get. And then that repeats. And people come back, because people are hurting out there, and people are in pain, and people are suffering. And when the doors open, they'll come in. If the doors close, they're scared. 
Um, so we just said we're going to go right where the people are. We'll put it right in the right next to uh, Countdown, and we're just going to put a strip mall church and say we're going to we're going to give we're going to go into the community and help people uh, the way. One of the things that I don't have a good picture for them. I apologize. Um, all of them that I have just weren't very good. But we did the same thing. We started them in a in a church. I went to Adra and I asked for some community engagement money for teaching language courses. Refugees, after they got to New Zealand, uh, they get one year free language Spanish to English courses. And then what I found was they were here for their first year, that language expired, and then they were sitting there without language skills. They were in our church and they were kind of stagnant for a year. We had a Bible worker and it wasn't really working. And I, and I, and I ran a marriage course for Spanish speaking out in the community. And when I, when I did it, I got a feedback from the Spanish people saying, we don't speak Spanish, we can't read Spanish because they were refugees, meaning they were plucked up from out of problems and they may not have been skilled. <laughs> Whoa. There we go. They were plucked up and placed in New Zealand and their one year of language skills wasn't enough. So I went to my Spanish coordinator, she's a translator, I said, what can we do to go into the community to find a need that wasn't there and as a church help people? And she said, let's teach them English. So we got a small grant from Adra and that was all we needed. We bought a computer, we bought all these resource books, we bought language translation, Rosetta Stone, and we just started teaching English because their free language had started and they're on the benefit and they don't, can't afford it. And then it just started going like this because there was people who cared. And we outgrew in Lower Hut Church, there's 65 people and we had 40 in there speaking Spanish and all of a sudden the tensions were there. I, I know you know how that goes, where one, where two different groups are competing for space and resources, but they had grown large enough to say, let's go get your own space. And that just happened in the space of a year. It just it was just, wow. Um, just doing, going to the community and just trying to provide, pro filling the gaps, parenting now in Spanish because they all came with their kids and language courses, um, engaging the community where they're at. And then we did the same thing with the Jewish Adventist group. This was specific down in um, Wellington is because my, my wife has a doctorate in, in Jewish um, uh, Messianic Judaism and then I have a master's in Judaism and working on a PhD. And we, we saw uh, the, the synagogue next to us had closed down their educational center for training children because of lack of leadership. So we, we said, hey, let's make a conscious effort to go to a specific community of people and engage uh, training and leadership of the children. So I started a, a um, kind of a net series. It's a, I started an afternoon uh, children's training religious education course in a home. And then we started inviting people from the embassy and, and they just started coming because there was no good religious education. Now the synagogue has 600 people, but they weren't providing the needs. And then that started growing, that started growing. Next thing you know, I aligned with one of our churches who sponsored it. All of a sudden, you have between 18 to 30 people every week because you're filling a gap in the community where there was just, you know, the market. We could go in, there was a void in the market and provide religious education for people who weren't getting it. And what I found was, was that we were getting split families. One was Jewish, one was Christian, and they're living together in New Zealand because this is New Zealand. And then it provided a safe place called Adventism, which people could practice both faiths. <laughs> and it became this, it, it's it actually quite an interesting phenomenon, and I've aligned now with um, uh, Pastor Tato, and I'm and, and offering it up to any other pastor is, um, I'll talk about it next time. The uh, general conference has three different missions, one's called, or four different missions, but one's the Jewish, Adventist, Jewish mission, a uh, mission to Jews, mission to Muslims, mission to postmoderns, and then, you know, so what we've done is we've taken the mission to Judaism and I'm putting that side by side with other pastors and trying to say there's a huge outreach here because there's Christians who are going back to the Hebrew roots that will double your congregation size if you disciple them right. And then there's Jews who are living with Christians that won't uh, go to a Adventist church but they won't go to a Jewish synagogue because their families are split and simply Adventist church is the right place for them to be. Uh, and that was a specific Jewish missional plan. And then this one did not become under my mentorship under the Healthy Adventist Church Planting Network, but from Wellington Adventist Church we did take a gentleman named Reno and Diane who used to be on the executive committee 
and I was very adamant in supporting him. And then as he left, he went and planted a, it was called the, I'll shut it down now. He went and planted a group called uh, Wellington Community. So in Wellington, we went from having one church, to now we have four. And even though a lot of people complain about changes and demographic changes, what you're seeing now is it, there's four different nets and four different ways to bring people in.